Uh, folks, this morning uh, we have an opportunity to pray together, uh, unite our hearts in prayer, and uh, pray that we find great joy and great strength in that during this time. Uh, let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, thank you for your presence in this place this morning, and thank you for your presence in our lives. We don't know what we would do, where we would be without you. And we bless you that we have the opportunity to come into your house this day, uh, to sing praises to your holy name, uh, to lift up Christ our Savior. And we pray, Lord, as I, as I prayed in the prayer closet this morning, as we lift up the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, that you would lift up our hearts and that you would strengthen us, that we would find great joy and great peace, uh, great comfort in knowing that you're always there, that you never leave us nor forsake us. And so we pray that everything uh, today would bless your heart. Uh, everything today would be to the praise and the glory of our Savior. Uh, Father, we, uh, you know we live in troubled times and, and our hearts are troubled when we take our eyes off of you, when we take a look at what's happened in our country, what, what happens in our communities, what we see on the news uh, each and every night. And uh, it easily distresses our soul. And yet, um, uh, as we sung, it is well with our soul. Uh, especially when we consider our lot and our, our plight. And we, we bless you uh, that, uh, as Harold reminded us, that we can be called, that we are called the children of God, and the privilege and the honor uh, that comes with that, and the responsibility that comes with that. Uh, thank you uh, this morning uh, for the reminder that we could be called, we are called children of God and sons and daughters of the living God. And we pray, O oh God, that uh, we would take our eyes off of the things um, that distort our focus, uh, that cause us uh, strife in our hearts, uh, anxiety, stress, and that we might be able to fix our eyes on you uh, more constantly. Uh, more of a focus, uh, more with uh, a clear resolve uh, that we would look to you and not look to a government or politicians or others to solve our problems. That we, we bless you and we thank you uh, that we can find strength in you. Uh, Father, I, I want to lift up the number in our congregation, Lord, that uh, do not make it out whether it's health reasons, um, out of concern, uh, or fear, uh, whatever it may be, whether it, it be the encouragement of a doctor, or even if one physically can't make it or their soul is downcast, we, we lift them up. We pray that they would sense your presence and they would find great strength and hope and peace and joy in you not only uh, at this moment, Lord, uh, but that, that they would lift up their eyes. Uh, I think what the psalmist says, that they would lift up their eyes unto the hills and from whence, whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And I pray that they would find great, great strength and hope and joy and peace to their hearts during this time. I pray that that would also be our, our prayer as well. Uh, again, we bless you for your presence. We thank you for this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, we have our first scripture reading. Dave? This morning's first scripture reading from the Old Testament, from the book of First Kings, the 17th chapter of First Kings. That's on page 345 in the Red Church Bible. Again, First Kings, the 17th chapter.
Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been a, no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me please a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word that the Lord had spoken to Elijah. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what have you against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Our second reading this morning is also from the Old Testament. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, and that's found on page 650 of the Church Bible. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. 
but pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. This, too, is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we give you this time. Open up the eyes of our hearts uh, to the glory of Christ. Uh, and Lord, I pray that in my weakness this morning that you might be made strong in this place among your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So folks, this morning I want to talk to you about the perils of social isolation. Uh, and I think that all of us can kind of relate. Uh, during uh, this time of COVID-19 lockdowns, we're encouraged to social distance. You know, the government says uh, social isolate, social distance, right? Now, folks, I'm only 63. Many of you are quite older. Uh, but I've been around long enough to know that the government doesn't do many things well. Amen? They don't. Sometimes the intent is good, but the results are a disaster. Sometimes the intents are devious, and the results are a greater disaster. What evidence do I have for this? Read what virology experts say. Now, I'm not a virology expert, but read what the medical, many medical professionals are saying. Our immune systems work in such a way when we're exposed to germs, it gets stronger. And when we're isolated, it gets weaker. That's how it works. That's how it works. Herd immunity strengthens, isolation weakens. Herd immunity lessens the curve. So what other reason could it be other than political or financial to social distance and to isolate? I saw a headline the other day. Democratic governors and mayors are now saying the economy needs to be opened up. How convenient. What timing. What, wasn't the former administration saying for months that that should be happening? Ironically, and this is, this is ironic, the COVID-19 numbers are actually up higher now than when we went into lockdown, and now they're saying opening up, open up, open up. It's, it's incredible. Now, if you follow the news, news, you know that months ago, the head of the CDC said that masks don't work. And then a month later, he came out and he said, masks do work. And then he was seen at a baseball game not wearing a mask. So tell me, what does the government really do except really well make a mess of things? Pretty much. So we're going to look at what the scripture says this morning about social distancing and social isolation. And... Let me tell you, folks, I'll give you a little hint. It's more destructive than helpful. We're not wired to social isolate and to social distance. The government has placed arbitrary and surreal expectations upon our society. Other governments throughout the world have done that as well. But if you take a look at the stats, like, for example, Sweden... They didn't lock down. They fared much better than anybody else. They protected their elderly, who are most susceptible. But they never went into lockdowns. So what does the scripture say about social distancing and social isolation? Solomon is the author of Ecclesiastes. What does Solomon say? Now, let me give you uh, 
a little bit of a backdrop here because we always want to interpret Scripture in its context, right? Solomon is talking in Ecclesiastes about life being very empty if we live and seek it apart from God. That's his overall premise. Everything's vain and futile if you seek life and you live life apart from God. And when you read the book, it comes across very pessimistic. But it's actually very realistic. And Solomon says that self-determination is destructive. Left to my own way and left to your own way, we would self-destruct. Kind of like that Mission Impossible tape. Remember that? This tape will self-destruct in five seconds. So this is why our society and our country are imploding because we're trying to do it without God. Self-determination is self-destructive. And so in chapters 1 through 6, Solomon talks about self-determination. And he talks about going alone without God and going in alone by yourself. The results are not good. And then in chapters 7 through 12, he talks about wisdom's advantage, the wisdom from above. And the wise thing to do is go with God, don't go it alone, and the results are way better. Amen? It's just the way it works. And so, if you, the, the structure of Ecclesiastes is where every chapter is actually a monologue. And it's topical. on particular subjects as Solomon, the wise man, has observed throughout his life. And so we come to chapter 4, and this is a monologue about, it's actually kind of a better than monologue. It's like better than sayings. And he analyzes things and he says, this is better than that. And what, they, what he actually does is he classifies them into three categories. The third category spills into chapter 5. The first one is uh, social, the second one is political, and the third category is religious. We're going to look at the social aspect this morning. And what we want to do is we want to contrast socially between social isolating and having a social support system and not social distancing and not social isolating. And what we're going to see is the importance of companionship and friendship. And let me, let me qualify that, especially godly character, uh, companionship and friendship. Uh, you know, show me your friends, I show you your future. That expression, you've heard that. So what we see here is, we're going, what we're going to see is the importance of friendship and companionship and the destructive qualities of being alone and isolated and lonely. Now, I think we've all felt lonely before, and we, you can actually feel lonely in a large crowd, believe it or not. Been there, done that, right? But we've, we've all experienced loneliness in some form or fashion. We've all been isolated, and it's, and, and it's not being in a good place, amen? And so, the importance of companionship and friendship uh, we've heard the expression, no man is an island. In other words, it's better to be socially associated than socially disassociated. It's better to be socially connected rather than socially isolated. Friendship is to be valued over loneliness. Sociable is more preferable to solitariness. And so it's fair to say that life without God and friends, it's destructive it's depressing, and it crushes the human spirit. And, and get this, it happens very slowly over time. Like every degrading system that we might find ourselves in, it's, it's a slow degradation of the soul, the heart, the mind, the spirit. And in large part, this is why we see depression and destructive behavior in our society. Self-determination, and then you throw on top of this the whole craziness of lockdowns and social isolating. Now, 
You tell me if social isolating and distancing during COVID-19 has actually helped our society or hurt our society. Of course it's hurt our society. It's made it worse, not better. You know, that I, I love the Southwest Airlines commercials, right? Want to get away? They ought to change that question to, no, I am getting away. But the problem is, that's social distancing, right? We don't want to do that. But it's, it's just the madness. I want to get away from the madness and the insanity and the stupidity and the lunacy. And, you know, you just can't make some of this stuff up. Social distancing and social isolation is destructive and it's unbiblical. And they should have never mandated it in the first place. I told you months ago, did I not? Watch the narrative. I stood here many Sundays. I told you, watch the narrative. It will change after the election. Did I not? I'm not a prophet. But God does give me insight into some things. And I think he does that for you as well. It's all about the optics. I always said, you know, you could put a, put a nice suit on. Doesn't necessarily mean you're getting what's on the inside, right? So if you take a look at Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, it's the social principle that we need other people in our lives. That's what Solomon's saying. It's a creational principle. We were studying uh, on Wednesday night, Genesis 2, 18. The scripture says that it is not good for man to be alone. God made that assessment. We're social beings. It's a creational principle. And it, and it even stands apart from marriage. If you're not married, you understand the importance of companionship and friendship. You... you you don't want to be alone all the time. And so men and women are social beings. There is the need for other people in our lives besides just, you know, your pet dog or your pet cat or your pet turtle. <laughs> you know, you need, you need people rather than just animals. So let's take a look at the text here. Because I, I, think, it, I think it stresses the need for social, a social support system. Companionship here. Uh, verse 9, working together, doing things together. This text, uh, this scripture here, is not specifically relating to physical labor and going out and working. You know, like, say, uh, you know, uh, being, uh, you know, partners uh, in, you know, in some sort of business. It is working together. It is doing things together. It could apply to the material, but I think it goes way beyond that, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But verse 9 uh, oh, and the other thing I want to say is, you'll notice the illustrations here are primarily drawn from a person who travels. That's the illustration that Solomon used. So verse 9 makes the point for the need of companionship. Verses 10 through 12a, the first part of 12, stresses the illustrations. And verse 12b restates the matter, three are better than two. In other words, it's significant to have friends. More than just one, and more than just two. You know, the, the more the merrier. And, and, and here's the other thing, too. Take the, 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 the assumption, if you take a look at verse 10, there's going to be pits and rocky roads along the way. You might fall down and, and, and twist an ankle or hurt a knee. Verse 11, there's cold nights. Travelers, you know, you, you, you're, you're especially in the in, in Middle East, in a desert climate, it gets very, very cold at night. Blazing sun in the day, very cold at night. And then verse 12, you have bandits. The concern for bandits. Now, you know, we hop in our SUVs and we go to f from point A to point B. But if you were to try to, say, walk from here to Boston or here to Providence, it's, it's a different dynamic, right? And so these, these, the, the, these perils face the ancient traveler. And, and Solomon is looking at this and says there's, there's the need to do things together and have people in your life for a support system. Now, it's interesting. I didn't have verse 8 included in the text, but let's read it. Because Solomon uses verses 9 through 12 as a point of contrast. In verse 8, 
Actually, let's, we'll pick it up actually in verse 7 here. Solomon writes, Then I looked again at vanity under the sun. There was a certain man without a dependent, having neither son nor brother. Yet there was no end to all his labor. Indeed, his eyes were not satisfied with riches. And he never asked, And for whom am I laboring and depriving myself of pleasure? This too is vanity and is a grievous task. So the, the contrast here is uh, an independent, wealthy, miserly man who is social isolated and social distance. And he lacks friendship and companionship. And Solomon says, that's vain, that's futile, that's not good. And if you contrast verses 8 through 9 and 12, I want you to notice the movement. Verse 8 is one person. Verse 9 is two people. And then verses... Uh, verse 12, it goes from 2 to 3. And this is a progression here. It's very, very significant that have people in your life. And now, uh, for those who like to get into all the nuts and bolts, this is actually kind of considered to be like the classic numerical proverb. If you go into the Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, what does Solomon say? There are three things I've seen, even four. There are six that the Lord hates, even seven, or that kind of thing. And it's called the numerical proverb. But what it does here is this. It advances the thought that two are better than one and three are better than two. And it advances the thought, as we take a look at this here, to do things on your own and to stay isolated and social distance. It's not good for your soul. Four illustrations here. Walking, um, doing projects together, walking together, lying down together. Mutual protection if you're robbed, you know, traveling along the road. Now, this is interesting here. Take a look at verse 11. This has got nothing to do with any sexual aspect of a relationship. It's got nothing to do with marriage. This is the traveling analogy, right? And, and, and so... Think about it. If you're cold and you, and you, and you get body warmth from one another, you, all, you have two coats or cloaks instead of one. All right? That's the sense here. The miserly man, he's all alone. He's rich. And he seeks to do his own thing. You know, I, I was actually looking at uh, verses 7 and 8. And, you know, I started to think, you know, in, in our, somebody just won a Powerball, like, was it a billion a billion point five or so, I don't know what it was, billion point zero five, some ridiculous amount of money. I guess the zero, the zero point, point zero five doesn't matter if you get to a billion, right? But isn't there this, we, we applaud wealth and we, you know, exalt it in our society. And there's this sense that you're always better off when you have a lot of money, right? That's an assumption. We assume that wealth brings happiness and friends. How many times has Harold stood up here when sharing the offertory time, talked about uber wealthy, wealthy people 7,500 years ago that were absolutely miserable? I mean, Henry Ford talked about that. Rockefeller talked about that. It, it, it may be a false assumption uh, that wealth makes things better and uh, we're happier. In fact, I would argue that wealth often leads to miserliness and greed. You have to worry about losing it if you got it. It can lead to separation. It makes wealthy people suspicious. Why do they want to get close to me? Oh, they want my money. What does Paul tell Timothy? Many have pierced themselves with a lot of trouble because they've desired to get rich. <clears throat> And yet, most of us would probably say in our heart of hearts, boy, I wish I hit that Powerball. Well, you know, you, sometimes you take a look at what Scripture says, and it's like, praise God I didn't hit the Powerball. Amen? Bob Ganaway always says, I don't want any part of it. That's, that's a wise man. Many wealthy people are unhappy. They cannot trust the people around them. They isolate themselves at times from others and society. You get very, very eccentric over time. 
Contrast this with the blessings of friendship. Friends are tried and true. Amen? True friends are tried and true. There's a friend that sticks closer than a brother, Solomon says. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. That's another proverb. So the value of friendship here cannot be measured. Cannot. Now, I said to you earlier that some want to make... Uh, uh, verse 9 is not about simply labor and material gain. Some want to simply make verse 9 about hoarding as opposed to... Sh or sharing as opposed to hoarding cooperating to make a buck, I'm going to suggest to you that it's way beyond that, and I'll give you a sense here of it. Solomon is specifically highlighting the social and psychological value of being there for one another. And we all benefit by having other people in our lives, amen? I mean, we do. We seriously do. Now, what some do is they come to this passage of Scripture... And they want to spiritualize it um, about having God in your life. So, for example, what they'll do is they'll look at verse 9 and they'll say, well, it's, you know, Jesus is helping us with the project. Uh, verse 10, Jesus is picking us up when we fall. Uh, verse 11, uh, when we lie down and rise up, he lies down and rises up with us. And someone even suggested, you know, the three chords being better than two are Trinitarian bonds. That's not what Solomon's saying here. It, it makes for great devotional thought, but that's not what Solomon is saying. Jesus is always there. The Holy Spirit lives within. The triune bond can never be broken. And Solomon exalts sojourning with God and walking with God and fellowship with God, but that's not the point that Solomon's making here. Solomon is teaching about the need to interact with people. Negotiating the social landscape is huge. We fare better when we have people to help us in our life. When there's a difficult project, and I don't know much about it, I love people to come along the side of me and teach me what I don't know and what they know. When I fall down, spiritually, I love for somebody to say, you know, hey, Let's get up. Let's keep on going. Amen? I love it when people lift us up. It's their need for being there for others, to help others, to be a blessing. How else do we witness and, and share Christ in our life? I want to talk about the emotional uplift because I, I, uh, I think it's absolutely huge. Uh, you know, I, I've said, I said to somebody a couple times... They say, oh, how are you doing? It's like, I don't know. I sometimes feel like I'm depressed. You know, you ever feel like you're kind of down? I'm, it's like you feel like under this great weight of oppression and depression. I mean, it's like what's happening in our society. I mean, yeah, even, even pastors can feel down and depressed, okay? Very, very honest. You know, I said that to one person. I said, I'm done with it all. And they said, yeah, you and me both and everybody else. I think they knew what I was talking about. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Paul talks about bearing others' burdens and fulfilling the law of Christ. You cannot do that. I cannot do that if we social distance and isolate. We see this principle carried over in Luke chapter 24. I love Luke chapter 24. Remember the, the, the two disciples after Christ had resurrected, but they didn't realize that at the time. They're walking along the Emmaus Road, right? And they're downcast. They're depressed. They're just so discouraged. All their hopes and their dreams about Christ making society better were dashed. So they thought. And they're walking along, and next thing you know, Jesus comes along beside them, right? And I look at that passage and I say, those, those two guys needed the human touch. They needed Christ there to show up. And he gave them what they needed. But I, 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 I stop and I think, can you imagine if God never showed up that day when they were walking? What would the rest of the conversation have been like? That would have been so depressing. 
Then I asked the question, what happens if it was only one disciple walking along? Probably be even more depressing. So without Jesus and without somebody else, that's a pretty depressing and bleak kind of environment. You know, we see the need for people in our society just by expressions we say, right? For example, the principle of two being better than one. You know what we say? Don't go walking in the woods alone. Not a good idea, right? Don't go, God bless you, don't go swimming alone. Not a good idea. Don't travel alone ideally, although my wife's doing that today. But you know what we tell her? When you get out, be aware of your surroundings, take a beeline right to where people are and get back to your car, but be aware of it. Now, ideally, those are ideals, right? Doesn't all, we don't always have the opportunity to do those things, but, but, but we, we stress the value through expressions and sayings. L listen, listen to what the Talmud says. The Talmud is a comprehensive written collection of the oral written law, but with commentary. And with this passage regarding companionship and social support, uh, it says, a man without a companion is like a left hand without the right hand. You're handless, so to speak. Now, let's translate all this into what we've been encouraged to do. It's unbiblical. Repeatedly throughout the COVID-19 talk of lockdowns and all the medical misinformation and disinformation, all the lies surrounding the deadliness of the virus, the response, I said, was going to be worse than the virus. The masks, the social distancing, the social isolation, and caused nothing but destruction emotionally in its wake. People are stressed, they're frustrated, they're done with the insanity. And, you know, I, I reflect, this is a moral evil. This is a moral evil of our day, of magnanimous proportion. It's unbiblical, and much of what's happening in our society is totally unbiblical. How many loved ones died in isolation? That is so wicked. It's sad. Thank you, it's sad. How many have died in isolation that never had the virus? You know, waving to your loved one outside a window. Are you kidding me? We, had, we have people in this congregation that had to do that. It's wicked. How many are depressed from the lockdowns? How many are resorting back to past behavior, substance abuse, stress, anxiety, loss of job, or for, for fear of loss of job, or the fear-mongering of losing one's life? I, I know somebody who knows somebody, a family member, extended family, they're petrified, petrified of the whole thing. You know, if your hairdresser comes to the house, we got to sanitize everything and open the doors, the windows. It's insane. And they live in a very cold environment. Uh, Brett, Brett sent me, uh, Brett's away for sea term, right? So he, he sent me a cartoon. It's great. It's showing this couple watching TV. And the commentator on the TV is saying, what can we do to stop living in fear? And then the next thing it shows them taking the remote and turning off the TV. <laughs> that solves the problem, doesn't it? I want to share some statistics with you about the unhealthy environment being imposed upon our society. First of all, the mask. You think that's doing you real good? 2% out, 2% in, everything else restricts your breathing and all the germs that come in and out just stay right there for you to breathe in. That will cull the herd, trust me. 
There's no need for it. There's no justification medically or statistically for locking everything down. CDC Morbidity and Morality Weekly Report, this was done back in June, um, and it was about mental health, substance use, and suicidal ideation during COVID-19 pandemic. June stats, right? 40% of adults have been affected. American people have been affected. Four out of 10. Uh, anxiety and depression symptoms were up 31%. 13% uh, were up with substance abuse. Trauma and stressor-related disorder symptoms, 26% up. And 11% seriously considered suicide. Oh, that's real healthy for our environment, right? And the groups most affected, according to this article, young adults, racial and ethnic minorities, essential workers, and unpaid adult health caregivers. I'll give you another article, just so you know I'm not cherry picking here. September 2, prevalence of depression symptoms in U.S. adults before and during the COVID-19. This is from the Journal of American Medical Association, JAMA, okay? Quote, in this population representative survey study of U.S. adults, we found that prevalence of depression symptoms was more than threefold higher during COVID-19 compared with the most recent populated, population-based estimates of mental health in the U.S. This increase in depression symptom prevalence is higher than recorded after previous mass traumatic events. In other words, traumatic events in, in past history other than COVID, right? And it goes on to say it's social and economic consequences um, pre, uh, higher than previous uh, um, influence or prevalence and uh, social and economic consequences than other previously studied mass traumatic events. It seems important to recognize the potential for the mental health consequences of COVID-19 to be large in scale, to recognize that these effects can be long-lasting, and to consider preventative action to help mitigate its effects. In particular, this burden is being borne by economically and socially marginalized groups. Medical news today. U.S. cases of depression have tripled. It's another article. This is September 19th, 2020. This survey questioned participants regarding the various stressors associated with the pandemic. These stressors included the death of a friend or loved one and financial worries such as the loss or potential loss of personal income. The survey found that the symptoms of depression had risen in response to the pandemic all across demographic groups. Maybe that's why I felt down from time to time. Professor Sandro Galea, a dean at Boston University Public School of Health, is the senior author of the study. He says, quote, depression in the general population after prior large-scale traumatic events has been observed to at most double. The numbers of adults experiencing depression in the U.S. during COVID-19 has tripled. Tripled. And so what is happening is unprecedented and uncalled for. And what we're seeing is the, 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 the evil of social isolation. And I ask you, is it worth it? You know, growing up on the streets of Philly, you know, we had a lot of, a lot of immigrants and a lot of... I grew up in, a, in the Logan section, which, which was very, very diverse uh, ethnically. We had a lot of Ukrainians and a lot of Koreans, uh, a lot of black people. And, um, but there was this, two doors down, there's this one family. They, I don't know if they were Czechoslovakian or you know, somewhere like from the Balkans or whatever. They, but they came from behind the Iron Curtain. And they were very, very nice. You really couldn't strike up a conversation with them. They were very quiet people. But you know, I, I, I reflect, reflected on their social behavior. Something wasn't right. And, you know, they would, they would peer out the curtain constantly. 
like there was some sort of social paranoia. I I'm totally convinced it was because they grew up behind the Iron Curtain. They were concerned about people, their neighbors, their family members, their friends, their workers, ratting them out. Uh, it was sad uh, as I reflect on it. And I'm, this is not the first time I've reflected on it. I knew that back then. There was something wrong with this family. Uh, it's just, you know, it's devastating. Devastating. It's, we're not meant to live that way. Solomon moves from the isolated, rich man who's socially distanced, and he talks about the strength in numbers. Do you have that support system today? If you don't, you need it. The other thing that occurred to me, and I'm, I'm not too far from being done, the other thing that occurred to me, you read the Bible, read the Gospels. Didn't they social distance from lepers? That, that's, when, that's when they didn't have a cure. That's when it was legitimate because, you know, it was, it was pretty much a death sentence. But, you know, you go into places and they treat you like a social leper. I've got extended family that I saw back in December. They treated me like a leper. I was like within 12 feet and they start putting up the mask. It's insane. I guarantee you that there are way more other things statistically that will kill you than the virus. Guaranteed, hands down. Do your work. Do your homework. Don't just listen to what people parrot and try to brainwash you with. The lockdowns, folks, are destroying people. Mentally, emotionally, socially, spiritually, economically, and intellectually. Maybe one of the greatest moral evils of our time. This passage is about being with others. What are they telling you? Stay away, socially distance, right? They don't even do it themselves. What does the Word of God say? Two chords are stronger than one, three stronger than two. What did they tell you around the holidays? Oh, don't go over to, don't, don't hang out with family, spend it alone. Yeah, that's real healthy. You know, uh, thank God we have a First Amendment because a lot of this stuff has been challenged. But you know, the First Amendment right now is in tatters. It's challenged all over the place. Appreciate it while you can. Let me ask you this. If we didn't have a First Amendment in this country, do you think we'd have the right to meet here today? No. no. Someone said social distance, don't social isolate. <laughs> it's kind of comical. That's like saying go swimming, but don't get wet. <laughs> Try that one on for size. You know, as I read the scripture, and as I take a look at what's happening, Christians need Christians more than ever before. Hebrews 12, 24 and 25, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 24 and 25 says, do not keep yourselves from gathering together God's word said 2,000 years ago, for the last 2,000 years, don't social distance and don't social isolate. 1 Corinthians 12, the need for the body of Christ. You know, when we social distance from the church, we hurt ourselves, we hurt the church, we social distance from other people, we hurt them, we hurt our families, a whole lot of hurt going around. Through the years, I have known believers to isolate themselves from the church. Usually it's because of sin or backsliding. Listen, we all sin and we all backslide. 
The difference is some just stopped coming to church. Some still come to church and hide it well. Others push through it. But the feedback that I have constantly gotten, I miss the fellowship. I miss the human touch. I miss the companionship. I miss the camaraderie. I miss the people. I've always said this. Charles Stanley will give you a great message. But he's not going to put his hand on your shoulder and pray with you. He's not going to cry with you. And he's not going to come to a funeral when you bury a loved one. The electronic church is better than nothing. But it lacks. Because it doesn't have the human touch. One other quick comment here. Why do I sense that we have quite a few leaders that would love for the churches to be closed? They would love for the fact that Christians don't gather. Did you ever get a sense of that? What's, what's wrong? Something seriously wrong, folks. They sound like fringe comments. They're not. You've seen the news. Pot stores are open. Churches have to be closed. Liquor stores are open. Oh, you can't worship. That's insane. I, I guarantee you, like I don't mind having a drink from time to time. I'm not that legalistic. I, I, don't have, I don't have a problem with having a drink at all. But I'll tell you what. Spiritually, God has done more for me than a drink ever has. Why would you shut the churches down? You would want to open them up and shut the other stuff down. And so what we have here now, okay, let's connect the dots. Moving forward, we have a precedence now that's been established to shut the churches down. That's what we have. Who knows how it goes under this new administration? I don't know. I think they'll probably open things up to make, you know, things look better. It, it, so, as I close here, uh, quickly, if COVID-19 concerns have socially put you in a bond of fear, a state of depression, struggling with loneliness, mentally struggling and you're not yourself, find strength in God, find strength in a support system, do your research, turn off the, re the TV. You'll, you'll have a, a much better frame of mind and perspective on life. Don't keep yourself from coming to church. Gather with friends. Reach out and encourage people. Pick up the telephone and say hi. A great technology, right? Pray for one another. Let them know that you're praying for them. Think of those that, who are isolated physically or mentally. They just can't get out of their own way right now. Be that person who labors to say, God loves you, let's pray together. Be that person who pities the downcast. Be that person who pities the one who's all alone. You'd be amazed at how reaching out will pick up your spirit. You know the times where I'm like, flat and somebody calls me and I have to counsel or encourage do you know that when I do that it actually helps me greatly as well when you're there for somebody not only does it greatly help them but it greatly helps you as well be a blessing don't social distance to the point of mental, social, spiritual, intellectual decline and destruction. Don't social isolate. It's a biblical evil. It's not biblical. You know, if, if we were dealing with the bubonic plague, you know, we'd have a different perspective on it, perhaps. But even then, they didn't social distance. They lost one-third of the European population. And they were still there for people. And we lose like these ridiculous, and, I, and every, every life is a life, I got it. But statistically, it's insanity. Let's pray.
Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, may we have ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts to perceive what's happening around us. Uh, may we not always listen to what they say, but watch what they do. Uh, may you give us a sense, Lord, of uh, Scripture uh, and um, living biblically during these times. May you give us a sense, Lord, um, of um, the evils uh, around us, and, and may we, you give us uh, the grace and the, the heart and the mindset uh, to know how to mitigate and uh, to live right and to live, uh, uh, to be what you want us to be and uh, as children of God and people of God during this time. And may we uh, find the strength to uh, lift up one another, to encourage one another, to build each other up, uh, to uh, be the human touch to our brothers and sisters in Christ during this time. Uh, we bless you and we thank you uh, for your presence, for your word, for the church, for this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.